Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our October Lunch and Learn webinar. Be sure to register for next week's in-person membership meeting on October 20th. It'll be located at Delmonico's Italian Steakhouse. It's at 5.30 p.m. and the topic will be energy management and sustainability. You can register for this particular meeting on the chapter website. Please be sure to use our Q&A tab or the chat function for any questions you may have for today's speaker. Now on to today's program. Our speaker for today is Jane Tierney who everybody knows because Jane is a returning speaker, who will be speaking on the topic of stop dollars leaking through the supply chain, draining the bottom line. Now, Jane founded her company, Purple Link, in 2015, recognizing there is a better way to obtain value and achieve results from and through supply chains. Jane has earned both in industrial engineering and MBA degrees. She is passionate about Lean and Six Sigma. She is a certified green belt, and she also has her CPSN and CPSD certifications. At this time, I'd like to take the stage over to Jane. Thanks so much, Kathy, and thank you, ISM Rochester, for asking me back. I always like meeting with you guys. It's a crazy time still. I think I've been saying that for too long now, but it is. Um, but I'm, I'm here and, and I'm excited about it. So I thought I'd share this with you just because I thought it was funny when I saw it. I can't remember where I snagged it. But um, when you think about all the supply chain turmoil we've had in the last year and a half, this kind of wraps it up. So we've got um, lots of things going on in there with, with our health and with our vaccines and everything else. So our supply chain is kind of in knots these days and it is across the, the country, as you know, and across the globe, actually, there's a lot of things going on. So today um, I'm excited to be here. I'm gonna talk about some tricks that I've discovered, share some knowledge and, and um, some of the lessons I've learned and, and that I've collected to try to save companies money and improve their bottom line. As you know, um, I'm a manufacturing person. I like doing that. And many of you have heard me before, so I won't go into too much detail, but there's a lot of my background that's helped me find ways for companies to really find those dollars that are leaking through their supply chain. They, I've worked with big companies like Hewlett Packard and finding their manufacturing processes and their supplier processes has really given me some insights into what companies can do with new product launches, project management, and all of the opportunities that come with working in the supply chain arena, in particularly working in procurement, working in those suppliers. Today, companies spend up to about 70% of their direct material on purchases, so they are very horizontally integrated. We bring parts in from all over the world. And it's really uh, a great opportunity for companies to look at how they can save money in these areas. So we're going we're gonna to talk about those things. And as always, I always like to stay connected to you. And I have some prizes. I have some pretty cool prizes today. So I always give away prizes at the end. But today, I want to tell you that I have tickets to ISM Buffalo's workshop next month. They're doing an all day workshop, six hours of CEHs on November the 5th. I'm actually flying in to do that. So it's gonna be one of my first in-person things. And I'd love to have an opportunity to meet some of you that I've met online over this last year. But I'm gonna give away two tickets to that uh, workshop at the end. So if you want to be participating in that um, raffle, then you need to send me an email to jane at purplelink.co and just put ISM webinar, ISM webinar, whatever. I'll, I'll get that at the end and I'll be able to pick a couple of winners and get some prizes. So again, um, that's for the workshop. I think it's a great opportunity. They're, they're charging actually um, $199 for this event. So this is a great um, opportunity to win this. You can go yourself, you can give it away, uh, but please make sure this ticket gets used. It's a great, great thing. So that's what we're gonna do. Um, today, we're gonna talk about pillars of supplier management. 
I think the one of the main keys to get value out of the supply chain is through supplier management. And there's a lot of dollars, like I say, that go through that supply chain. And there's ways to find those that are dripping through and draining your bottom line. But we need to look at supplier management. We need to look at organizational maturity because not all organizations are the same or as large as another organization. And I've talked to a lot of clients and a lot of companies who say, we really don't have a very big staff to do that. And I say, it doesn't take a big staff. It just takes some insight, some vision, and a little bit of working that into the other things that you do, because you do a lot of this anyway. And then we're going to talk a little bit about skills. If you have paid any attention at all, there's a lot of people um, that are looking for different kinds of jobs. There's a lot of companies that are looking for more people with different skills. They're trying to upskill. They're trying to augment and they're trying to replace workers that have left for uh, greener pastures. So we'll talk about all of that and then I'll give away those prizes. So I want you to think for a minute. I want you to think about how does your organization define value? This is a word that we use a lot, um, value and value add. We, we hear those all the time. I admit I use them too and they're thrown around the offices or the workplace very frequently. Um, but what really does add value or connotes value for your own organization? It's important to think about that and think about what that means. The second question is, what's the biggest value add contribution from your department or function? If you ask your colleagues and your, your peers and maybe your managers, the, the, the executives, what do they think is the biggest value add contribution that you and your team get, bring to the organization? And then finally, what do your internal partners consider the biggest contribution from your department or function? These are important things to think of because oftentimes we think of it very self-centric as to what I contribute, but you wanna think about not only what you think you can contribute, or are contributing, but you wanna think about it in terms of your stakeholders and what they actually feel and see that you contribute through you, your own contributions or through the department that you manage or that you're a part of. So let's look at this first and talk about um, value add. Companies and employees seek products and services that add value to their, the, to their company and enhance their brand. Within a company, people intrinsically understand what that value means, usually, and they recognize things that have or might add value to their organization. But people outside that circle and in a different company, value can have a lot of different meanings. So I'd like you to put into the chat right now just a couple of things that, that add value to your organization. And I'll give you just a, a half half a minute to do that, and then I'll share some ideas for ways that you might be defining value or that you could define value. Any, any thoughts? You can open your mic too and just innovation. There we go. That's a good one. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'll, uh, relationships. Thanks. I'll give you some ideas and you can tell me whether these resonate with you or not. So assurance of supply. In purchasing, that's one of our main focus areas to make sure that we have the right stuff at the right place at the right time in the right condition for the right cost, right? All of those rights. Assurance of supply. If we're missing any little part, then it means we can't go forward and there's a lot of heat on us to go find that. So I think that's one of the ways that we in, in procurement, in supply chain, add value to the organization. We make sure that there's parts coming in and that those parts are the right parts and that they are continuing to come in over time. So that assurance of supply can be inventories, it can be quality, it can be the perfect order, perfect fulfillment rates, um, you know, no shortages, that kind of stuff, and being flexible and making sure we have part availability when we need it. So that's one way you can do it. Financial contributions are another one. Um, this is an area where we in supply chain look at cost and financial performance. We have a lot to deal with that because 
the amount of money, again, that companies spend on direct material is huge these days. That percentage is very large. So we look at that performance of our suppliers. We look at our performance against our own goals. I haven't seen an organization yet, no matter how big or small, that doesn't track cost reductions throughout the year. So that's one metric that I see very commonly used. But we are also looking at things like overhead costs and, and how we manage those, what our contribution to the overhead costs is within our own organization and how our suppliers are managing that. We look at the cost of managing those orders and the inventory and the transactions that we have to do. We also participate in the cash to cash flow analysis. So there's financial obligations and financial implications there in things like our terms and conditions. What Payment terms is one hot button often used in procurement organizations about what, what kind of payment terms you put up for your suppliers. And then supplier management, I think, is another value added area that talks about strategic sourcing, contract management, and managing the performance of those suppliers. And it involves a lot of different aspects, more than the cost quality and delivery of that, but if at least that for any company. Time and responsiveness. The time and responsiveness is an important value add area, I think, because in, in supply chain, we look at things like cycle times, like lead times. We look at what it takes to process orders, how long it takes to get a requisition approved, or how long it takes to get a requisition converted to a purchase order, how we're optimizing the time that we have trying to manage and reduce lead times, or at least keep them stable enough so that we know how to plan around those lead times. And then the cycle times that our suppliers have, the cycle times that we have internally, all of those matter. And then finally, the strategy alignment, because we're looking at things like, is our company looking to compete on low cost, high quality, our service? What are the things that we do? All of those things can add value, but we want to make sure that the strategies of our organization align well with the strategies of our supply base and our own internal department. Because if we don't have that alignment, then there's going to be some, some friction possibly and some mixed signals that are going through the organization and through the supply chain. So here's some examples of what constitute values to companies. You can see that this builds from very tactical activities on the bottom to highly strategic initiatives that provide and uh, provide a company with a competitive advantage. Once you've defined what value is to your company, you can really start to work with your supply chain and to find those dollars that are leaking through and put strategies and plans in place to recover them. And remember, strategies are just plans and they kind of give you the indication of how you're going to do something, how you're going to achieve that goal. So what's important with this next step is knowing where to start with that and which suppliers really offer the best opportunity. So that takes us to supplier segmentation. And that's something that we want to emphasize, that I want to emphasize, and I've talked to a lot of companies, some clients and some companies that I've worked for, and they say, we do that. We know who our suppliers are. We don't have to spend time doing a formal segmentation process. But my own exper experience tells me that in order to find those dripping dollars, you want to start with the biggest opportunities. Companies use um, spend analysis as the basis for that. And I think it's a great place to start to use a spend analysis. You use that Pareto approach. You look at the 80-20 rule, the 80-20 split, and try to find the, the, caught, the suppliers that you're spending the most money with because that's probably where your, your opportunities are. And it is a good place to start, but it's only a place to start. I don't want you to stop there. So more than spend, you want to look at the history that you have uh, with that supplier, and then you want to project into the future. So when we do spend analysis, it's always a rear view mirror exercise. We say, what did we spend in the last six months, the last 12 months? And, and that's how we rate everything. But I say, go, if you're only going to do spend, then you at least need to go the next step and say, okay, that's what we did in the last 12 months. 
What are we going to do in the next 12 months? Are there some are there suppliers that are increasing their business with you because maybe your volumes on the projects that they're working with you on are increasing? Are there things that your company's end of lifing or phasing out? That means those suppliers are not gonna get that kind of spend that they had in the last year for the next year. Have you dual sourced something? So you're gonna reduce spend with one supplier and bring it into another supplier's pool of, of money. And then how have they, performed for you? Is this somewhere you want to spend your money? Also new products. This is an area that often gets neglected. When you look at spend, if you had a new product in development and this is a brand new supplier, you may not have spent very much money with them. It may be that you're primarily buying prototypes or beta units and you're doing some testing, or maybe you bought the first few production parts that you need. But if that's going to increase in the next year, you want to build that and meld that into your, uh, your spend analysis, because it's important to look at not only what we did, but what we plan to do in the future. Then you want to look at those that are critical to the business. Those types of suppliers can be single sources or sole sources. Sole sources, difficult to find, often have very high switching costs. Single sources may be easy to, to switch to another one, but you have all your eggs in that basket. And so that may make that critical to your business, even if the spend isn't one of the top, top five or 10%. Then you look at who has caused recent disruptions, which suppliers have been responsible for the recent hiccups that you've had or the recent uh, shoots that you've had to deal with. So look at where the problems are coming from. And if if that's their responsibility, something that they may have been able to prevent or something that they didn't alert you to early enough, then consider that and what you're going to do. And then also intellectual property is a really big element in business these days. So it's both your intellectual property, who's handling your confidential or your patented products or processes, and then whose process or product do you have designed into your products and, and the goods that you're offering your customers. If you have qualified a particular supplier into one of your products, then whether that part is expensive or not, whether the volumes are high, that's pretty critical to your business because you've gone through that qualification product process. And if you have to repeat that, that's going to take time and money and resources from your organization. Risk is a place to look Financial risk, especially today with all of the things going on with COVID, it's been just crazy and there's risk everywhere. So look at not only the financial risk, but risk in terms of quality, in terms of where they are location-wise, are there tariff issues or import issues? Are there um, terrorist issues in any of those places that they are? Look at the performance, the dependability, of that supplier, how have they done? How did you expect them to perform and did they live up to your expectations? And then finally, that business fit and willingness to collaborate. If you have suppliers that are really hard to deal with and don't seem to value your business very much, are those the ones that you really wanna hang on to? And those may be an opportunity for looking for those dollars that are leaking through the supply chain. The way we at Purple Link approach approving the bottom line uses a model that I've constructed that kind of builds on all of these suppliers so that you can identify those biggest opportunities, not just from spend, but from all the other factors that we just discussed. So let's take a look at that model. The first is supplier performance. And we all look at this as cost, quality, and delivery. But I often add in other elements of performance, things like responsiveness, the business fit, sorry about that, responsiveness, the business fit, social responsibility, compliance, technology, again, um, the geography of that, where everybody is today looking at their supply chain and understanding not only where their tier one suppliers are, but where their tier two and tier three suppliers are so that they can really make sure that they understand those. And is that where they need to be? Is that where they want to be in the future? Then relationships is the second piece. This is looking at the length of time you've done business with a supplier. And again, are they meeting your expectations or exceeding your expectations? <coughs> Excuse 
excuse me. Do you have a champion or a sponsor for that relationship within your organization and within the supplier's organization? Do you have clear escalation paths established? Are you doing scorecards on a regular basis, maybe quarterly with these suppliers to make sure that they're getting the feedback from your company and you're getting feedback from them on what's working and what's not? Are you involving them in new products, doing concurrent engineering products, any of those kinds of things? And are they sharing cost information, cost models, um, cost drivers? Are you working collaboratively with them? Those are the kind of relationships that are going to help you find these dollars and take them out of the leaking pool and put them back to your bottom line. The third area is supply chain risk and supplier risk. So this has to do with things that we've dealt with for decades, things like capacity and their capability. Do they really have all of the capabilities, all of the processes that we need for, as a customer to have them do? And then do they have capacity for our business? If we expect our business to grow, can they grow at the same rate that we can grow? Those are important. Financial strength, and again, finances is always a risk these days. So how viable are they? And are they actually a stable company or do they have some, some risk in that area? Then we get into things like business continuity. And do they actually have business continuity plans? Are they, are they enacting those? Have they had to enact any of those in recent times? Not only do we have a kind of a volatile environment politically and um, geopolitically, but we have had, had terrible problems with things like hurricanes, tornadoes. There were some severe storms over the, the last week in um, the Midwest, particularly Oklahoma, where they had a lot of tornadoes. We've had a pretty pretty big hurricane season. They ran through all their names and they had to go add names to their hurricanes. There were so many this year. So we, and fires, I'm in California. We have a lot of fires in this area up and down the West Coast. And those have been wreaking damage on things. So there's a lot of risk in things. And remember risk requires looking at both the probability and the impact of that event and saying, what, what effect might that have on me? And one of the other things, especially when you deal with small businesses, and that's if you work with a lot of government contracts, they're always espousing small businesses. And if you have a company who's got diversity in your values, they're looking for small and diverse businesses. Something that small businesses don't have often enough is succession plans. So you might have a business that's set up really good, robust business, great owner, but what happens when that owner decides that he or she has is finished? Maybe they win the lottery or maybe they decide to retire. What's gonna happen to that business? You wanna look at those things. And then finally, if you have all of these components and you're thinking about these and talking about these as an organization, that's great. But you know what? You got to have people that can manage that. You got to have people that have the skills that understand what procurement is, that understand total cost of ownership, that have the right ethics and compliance attitudes, that understand planning, can read blueprints, handle the logistics, and then the strategic pieces of those strategies, complex decision making, risk based decision making. So the way we've put that together is into a circle with different quadrants. And you can put any quadrant anywhere, but we drew it as a circle because it's like a wheel that propels your business forward. And you need all four pieces to actually get that momentum and move forward. So there's the four components that you need. But now, again, many companies tell me, well, we can't do all of that. We can't consider all of that. We, we don't have a very big organization. We have our people stressed as it is. And I say, you know what? Any organization can do better at this and you can find those dollars. So you want to look at where you are in this organizational maturity spectrum. And it is a spectrum. It goes from very um, immature, very unsophisticated organizations to very large hierarchical organizations with lots and lots of tools and, and technologies and systems and things. So the spectrum kind of goes from how many metrics do you use? What do you use to evaluate suppliers? That can be basic 
cost quality delivery, or it can be a lot more on scoreboards. And again, one size doesn't fit all. You don't do everything for every supplier. Then how reactive or proactive is your organization? Are you highly tactical and highly reactive getting requisitions and converting those into purchase orders? That's fine. Or are you more proactive, involved more in strategic sourcing and looking for uh, market analysis and market data that's gonna tell you which suppliers are the ones that you wanna be working with? What kind of structure do you have as part of your supply chain organization? And what kinds of processes? Do you have very basic processes? Do you actually have documented processes? If you don't, you need a few documented processes, but do you have a, a structure that um, is set up to support the rest of the organization? How about the financial perspective? Are you actually managing the money or is it? are you structured really under the finance organization where they're really looking at that and you're just doing the conversion and managing the goods themselves. The talent management that comes in there, how are you staffed? Do you have the kind of talent that you need? Could you use more or better talent in some areas? What kinds of relationships do you currently have with your suppliers? That's an area to look at. If you only have very um, basic relationships where buyers know their counterparts and that's pretty much it, then that can be expanded. What's your appetite for risk? This is an area that every company differs a little bit. And you need to look at your own personal appetite for risk and see if that's aligned with your company's appetite for risk. Tech companies tend to have a higher appetite for risk than be more risk tolerant. Government companies and defense contractors tend to be more risk averse and have a lower tolerance for risk. So where are you? Where is your organization? And where are your suppliers along that same thing? And then finally, is your, do you have a supply chain organization? Do you maybe have a CPO in the organization? Or are you structured under finance or under operations? And are you just a small organization? So how is your supplier management structured within your organization? So that gives us four levels of org maturity. And, and you can call these different things uh, when we put this model together, we looked at the most basic organizational maturity level being assurance of supply. This is what we call conventional procurement. It's highly transactional activities, getting requisitions, converting those, um, making sure that, that you're getting things done for the organization, but there's not a lot of strategies. There's not a lot of long-term planning. It's highly reactive. Then the second level is what we called procurement. This is where you start to get in some strategic sourcing, where you look at some category management or commodity management, where you're actually segmenting suppliers and you know who your key suppliers are. Maybe you're starting to do a little bit of um, more detailed metrics with that. The third level is integrated supply chain, where you're actually managing performance, you're setting expectations, you're setting up formal relationships, formal escalation paths, you might have a sponsor internally for a particular supplier and your supplier might have a champion for you as a customer. So you're expanding these relationships. You, you've got more involvement in stakeholders like from the quality department, maybe from the engineering department. And then finally, value management. This is where, as my friend says, you're cooking with gas. You've got supply chain as part of your organization, you might have a CPO. The supply chain in your organization is looked at as a competitive advantage. You do have some staff, you do have some tools. You might have an Oracle or SAP system um, or, or one of many, many others. It doesn't have to be those two brands, but that you have a robust MRP. You might even have ERP and value management. Uh, and probably do because you're really working to integrate that across the organization. So those are the levels of maturity. So again, look at where you are, look at where you might want to be and where to move into for the next few months. Another area that's really key in supplier management and finding these dollars is communication and doing that through cooperating and collaborating. So it's not just conveyance of status and yes, here's your PO, okay, that's gonna be due on the 21st 
and I'll let you know when it ships or you'll get the notice when it ships. It's really about getting more into the dialogue with that supplier and understanding what is what their drivers are, what their climate is, and sharing with them what yours are. So that involves things like lots of phone calls, not just emails back and forth, but some phone calls, some actual dialogue. Follow up and follow through are really important in this area and things like escalation paths. So communicating is very key and making sure that you have communication on several levels and you have it frequently. It needs to have a lot of trust. And that trust is something that is built up over time. What I've seen during the pandemic is trust was eroded between customer and supplier in some cases where they had done business a while and the supplier let them down or wasn't able to deliver what the customer wanted. And I've seen trust between two organizations that had not worked together before become solid as a rock because they helped each other through the pandemic. So I've seen, and then I've seen trusted and true <clears throat> suppliers continue to be the trusted suppliers, the reliable suppliers, the, the ones that companies depend on to get their things done. So it really requires that trust. It can be built over time, but I saw in the pandemic that it was built almost instantaneously between some organizations. You need that feedback that is a two-way feedback, customer to supplier, and also supplier to customer. And as a customer, you better be listening as much as talking. This is an important part of this to get that trust and to actually be able to collaborate and get that win-win scenario when you both can save money on, on opportunities. You're both identifying opportunities and you're both willing to share some of those savings with both organizations which requires some transparency, sharing some information, sharing things like cost drivers, sharing things like cost models. Um, I've seen instances where suppliers were very reluctant to share any cost modeling information, but when we started talking about the drivers, so it, is it their raw material or is it their labor rates or is it their overheads that they can't get through? So if we can find out what those drivers are, in particular, I've seen suppliers that struggled with one or more types of raw materials they were buying that they couldn't get very good rates on. And by working with the company that I worked for, we were able to help them reduce those rates, save on the material just by using some of the material suppliers that we used with ourselves or even with other suppliers to let them collaborate if they can reduce the material cost, then they can pass that on, at least in part to us. And for one, in my experience, I've always been happy to share the savings. I work with people who say, no, we identified that you're using our contracts. We should get all of the savings as the customer. And my attitude is if, if we can save money, that's great. And if they can save money, that's good too, because if they're happier about working with us and they're making a little bit more money and we're still getting our cost reduction, then that's a win-win scenario. So you need that commitment to the relationship and you need that from the entire organization. And we also need to think about beyond the pandemic. We're all in the midst of this. We're still kind of working through all of these supply chain challenges, but we need to partner now with suppliers to work through the rest of the pandemic, whatever that takes, and then move beyond that. So supplier management requires clear expectations. Many, many clients that I've worked with have been disappointed with their supplier performance. And I asked them, is your supplier really clear on what you want on this? Oh yeah, yeah, we told them, we told them. Okay, how did you tell them? What did you tell them? And many times I've seen that one company talks to the other, but they don't really expand on what they need. Their, their expectations and requirements aren't really clear. So there's a lot of assumptions. And if the supplier doesn't hear different feedback, they think what they're doing is fine. But the, but the customer may not be totally satisfied with that, but they're not taking the time to say, this is not what meeting our expectations. It's okay, but it's still a real pain for me and I'm not getting exactly what I want. But if the supplier doesn't hear that, see that, feel that, then they don't know to change anything they're doing. 
one way you can help with those metric with those expectations and reinforce those is with metrics. All right, how are you measuring the supplier? Another area that I've seen is a point of um, friction between supplier and customer is how you're measuring. And one of the easiest things to get tripped up on is delivery. So many companies I've worked with and around have said, oh, we measure supplier delivery this way. Many customers me measure it when the parts hit your dock and that's the when it's transacted into inventory. So that can work. But there can be a lot of things that keep that from getting into inventory. I've worked at a lot of companies that they have heavy days of deliveries <clears throat> from trucks and they don't get everything transacted the same day. Or, or companies, <clears throat> excuse me, or companies have incoming quality. So it might take two or three days to get through your incoming quality department. That's not the fault of the supplier. That's that's your own process that's keeping that from getting into inventory. So if you're measuring the inventory date, you want to look at maybe the dock date. And then suppliers usually measure from the date they shipped it. So, or the date it was scheduled to be picked up. So the truck couldn't come because of blah, 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 blah. But it was scheduled to be there. It was, it was ready to be there. So we counted it as on time. And you always have these issues with carriers when there's things like tornadoes and hurricanes and, and freezes in the wintertime when the, the the trucks can't get through or can't get picked up. Then nowadays with so much coming from China, yeah, the supplier says I had it to the dock there. It was there on the date it was supposed to be, but lo and behold, it got held up at the dock maybe in Shanghai. And then it's coming into the port of LA and it gets stuck there, can't get through, can't get even get the boat docked to get the containers off of that. Maybe the containers are, are not where they're supposed to be. The product is there but there's not enough containers to load to, to consolidate it all. So it gets to be a, a big mess in how you measure that. So that's one thing that you wanna do. Again, look at where your suppliers are, which ones do you value and trust and why? Not just because we've done business with them for 30 years. That's a bit, that will bite suppliers or that will bite customers. And it's happened a few times. I think it was about five years ago that, General Motors had a supplier that they'd had for 40 years. It was called, I think, Clark Cutler McDermott. And they had um, made small parts, uh, kind of foam and plastic parts that they make. And they made them in almost every car that GM produced in the United States. 40 year supplier, but they had a lot of problems. And guess what? They declared bankruptcy. General Motors had to get a court order to get them to go back, open up their plant, work for a couple more weeks. They had to make sure they could get all of their materials out that they had consigned, all of their tooling that they owned and, and actually get people to work to finish some parts to keep things going. And then they had to go requalify all of those parts. So it can be a, a supplier that you've known for a long time, done business with, but are they really trustworthy at this point in time? I've talked a lot about collaboration. It's one of my hot buttons, so I always do. And then you need some skill sets to manage all of this. You need to have people that understand some of these concepts. So we're going to look at skills a little in a little bit, but it shouldn't be surprising to anyone that there are certain skills that you need to identify these savings, which is really kind of the first step. And skills are used by companies in a little bit different ways. Um, for example, I think I have a pretty broad set of skills, but each of my clients is different and they have spe specific and unique challenges. So a solution in one company may not be a good solution for another company. I'll give you an example. One of my clients is in the defense and aerospace sector. They're subject to FAA regulations. Here in the U.S., that means Federal Aviation Administration, and that's where they're working, but they also have international uh, clients. Their, their products fly, so they have to conform with all of these rules and regulations that, government, um, that govern these types of vehicles. But I have another client that's in the cosmetics industry, which is a really different set of rules and regulations. It's the FDA, and they have to make sure that they're compliant with all of that. They both have inventory challenges, and they also have obsolescence issues. 
but the aerospace company can try to sell, reclaim, recycle some of that old inventory, or they decide just to hang on to it because they may need it for in the future. But the cosmetic company, if they their parts start to go um, old and that inventory starts to age, then they're going to have to scrap that. They can't they can't sell it at all. It becomes just scrap. So their scrap numbers are huge and they're trying to work those down. So we we're working with them to improve that. So again, inventory issues, obsolescence issues, but very different outcomes of that and very different ways of dealing with that. So I noted that there's a process to segmenting the suppliers. There's a process that you need to identify and prioritize the savings opportunities in your own organization. If you leave it to chance, you're gonna win a fuse and lose a few, but you're probably gonna be frustrated with the results. So you really need some standard approaches, standardized processes that help you identify these dollars that you wanna go after and try to save. So that includes metrics along with these measurement techniques as I talked about, relationship processes like escalation paths and scorecards and quarterly business meetings where you discuss what's going on and what you expect to be doing in the future and processes like business continuity and succession planning. And along with that, you're probably gonna need some tools. So these tools can be in the form of these skills. I do a lot of webinars on skills and building skills. And so I can talk forever about this. But in the interest of time, I'm just going to share some broad skill categories and talk to you about five types of skills that I find that we need in supply chain. And these really transcend industries, companies, countries. So each of these skills will contain both hard skills and soft skills. So here's a couple examples. If you have operations and supply chain skills, you need hard skills like capacity planning forecasting, um, blueprint reading sometimes. And then some of the softer skills are relationship building, uh, stakeholder inclusion, even negotiating has a hard skill component for an analysis piece and also the soft skill, the art of persuasion. Business acumen or business analytics, we more than ever in supply chain have to be able to do hard skill things like calculate ROIs and payback periods. We have to understand inventory turnover and be able to calculate that. But we need some soft skills in there too to look at how we utilize those soft skills uh, or excuse me, how we utilize those financial numbers. As I just talked about, you can need to get information from the supplier about their cost models. But if you can't get the numbers, maybe you can get the drivers and the drivers will lead you to the area. So working with knowing that if you can identify cost drivers, that will lead back to opportunities for doing that, soft skills and hard skills. Teamwork, a lot of soft skills in teamwork, but also some hard skills, Le learning about how to work with each other, how um, looking at different personality profiles and putting yourself in the other person's shoes. So we think of teamwork as heavily soft skills, and it is, but there are some hard skill components in there about understanding how you're doing that. Strategic decision-making, um, very, very hard to describe this, very hard to say, oh, you really need to improve your decision-making, okay? How do I do that? It's a hard thing to describe. It's a hard thing to to look at, it's a hard thing to learn or to teach, but there are some things you can do. So looking at longer horizons, looking at it from a higher level, not just from the immediate perspective that you have, but looking at it from longer term, looking at it as if you were the business owner or you were the business manager, the general manager, the CEO, or even the CPO can help you improve some of these areas. And then relationship building and influence, again, a big area of, of need in the supply chain arena, because that's what we try to do. We're all about building relationships between the customer and the supplier. We're influencing not only the suppliers, but other stakeholders in our organization, the production people, the marketing people, we're working with the finance people. If you can't build those relationships and have some influence in those areas, in thinking about collaborating and, and concurrent engineering and product development, 
You need people who can build those relationships and influence those decisions so you make the best decision for the company. So what I know for sure is there's a better way to manage the suppliers and to find those dollars that are leaking through your supply chain and you know that you can take those and put those back to the bottom line. Every company has challenges, but that also means there are opportunities. It's important that you have some metrics and it's important that you set very clear expectations for yourselves and for your suppliers. Uh, keep in mind that suppliers are just an extension of the operations of your organization. They really are not legal partners necessarily, but they are an extension and a partner in trying to reach your company's goals. Flexibility and agility are two things that can really support success. So don't think that you can just pound on the table and get those 3% reductions. Look for bigger and better opportunities. The more flexible you are and the more agile you are at looking at things from different perspectives, the more successful you're going to be in finding those dollars and putting them back to the bottom line. So this time of year, a lot of companies are wrapping up the year and they're assessing their performance and then they're looking at what they're going to do in 2022. Sometimes they find that they've fallen short and they hope, well, 22 might be better. How's it, you know, we want that to be better, but do they really know how to do that? Or if they've had a good year this year, they're saying, okay, great, we've done really well. How do we make 22 just as successful or maybe even better? Companies find that it's hard to sustain momentum and good results year over year. I think you know that. Most of you have probably seen that. So I've shared some basics with you, but I know that these are not really easy to implement, communicate, or bring into an organization. So I invite you to think about your company, your support system, who's in your corner to assist you with doing some of these activities to help find those dollars and put them back on your bottom line starting this quarter and definitely all through 2022. If you could use some outside support, I invite you to consider working with me. If you're impatient to get started or want to talk more, schedule a free call with me and we can talk about working together further. If you're like me, you attend these talks and you might get inspired by some of these things. But as soon as we turn off the Zoom, you go back to office mode, if not the actual office, and you get distracted by the latest disruption or you're trying to implement an idea that somebody doesn't really understand as well as you do. And all that can be frustrating. So take the first step and just schedule a call. If you go to callwithjane.com, it'll take you to my calendar and you can get signed up for a free call. So what I'm going to do now is if you um, schedule that call by the end of today, you're going to get the slides from this presentation and you're going to get our weekly webinars. And you're going to do that also if you send me a email right now to jane at purplelink.co. There's no M. If you send me that, you're going to get the slides. You're going to get the, the subscription to my um, two, twice a month webinars. And you're going to get to win this one of these two prizes that I'm giving away. So I'm going to give you about 30 more seconds to send me an email. And I'm going to look and see just how many people are interested in these great tickets that I'm giving away. And my phone is not cooperating. So let me see what I've got here. Okay. So I'm going to give you just about 30 more seconds. Anybody interested in these tickets? Okay. So our winners today are going to be Jeanette Zambrana and Kai Marion. So each of you will get a ticket to the um, ISM Buffalo event on 11-5. And um, I'll, I have your email, so I'll let you know how you do that. I, I think there's not an actual ticket that you, I'll just get you registered for the event and, and uh, signed up. So I'll make sure that that gets handled. Um, so that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna leave you with this and then I'll take questions. The, the, the thing that, I think is important when you're looking for making changes or improving results is 
to keep in mind that what you do today really can improve all your tomorrows. So if you and your company need cost savings, and I know every company always needs cost savings, then think about what you can do today to, to achieve that goal. So that's what I have. I'm gonna stop sharing and I will take questions or comments. Does anybody have any questions for uh, Jane for today on the topic? And uh, congratulations to the two recipients of the uh, uh, the the. Uh, yeah, I look it, forward to seeing you. Or is it is it a conference or is it a uh, a workshop? It's your workshop. Yeah, it's a it's, it's a conference. They're calling it. I have the afternoon session. They have I don't know three or four speakers. Okay, that's fantastic. Okay, um, I don't see any questions. No questions, no comments? We're not, we're just about out of time. We did get a few thank yous for your presentation today. Um, I would like to thank you, Jane, again, for coming to um, Rochester virtually. Uh, to Always happy to do this that. Important topic, I think is a very important topic and a very informative topic. And um, everybody, I have recorded this. I am still recording this. And I will be sending a copy of the recording to everybody along with your continuing education credit. Just a reminder, don't forget to sign up for the membership meeting in person next week. And also our next uh, Lunch and Learn is going to be on November 10th. It's going to be on decision science management. Actually, one of the topics you did talk about was more or less, um, you know, of strategic thinking. So uh, very, very uh good topic for next uh for next month as well good so, job scheduling uh, kathy yeah exactly exactly Get like topics in there supporting topics. <laughs> okay so thank you very much for uh joining us today and thank you jane for coming and my um, pleasure he has a great day okay hope to see some of you on november 5th bye okay take care everybody bye-bye